2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Jim. Today's the Feast of Transfiguration. I'm pretty sure none of you got a Happy Transfiguration Day card in the mail this week. It's not uh, one of those days which, through the year, factors very uh, large in uh, people's imagination or their reflections, even on spiritual things. But it's one of the most important events as we ponder together the life and the ministry of Jesus. And so you've just heard Paul writing about seeing what we don't normally see. Momentary light affliction is producing for us, he said, an eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, which are, Paul writes, eternal. Seeing the eternal right in the middle of the temporal. How does that happen? Well, it means that something has to happen to our gaze. Some supernatural work has to take place in our vision so that we see the unseen. And that's exactly what happened to the apostles in uh, Luke's Gospel in chapter 9. I want to read it for you this morning. Luke's nine, Luke chapter 9. And it says that after eight days, uh, after these sayings, Jesus took with Him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. It's Mount Tabor. That's where they are geographically. And as He was praying the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, uh, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we're here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days about what they had seen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Won't you pray with me? Lord, we confess our great blindness, our great need for the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our heart, to help us to see the unseen. Uh, open our eyes and our hearts to the treasures of your word and guide us, we, pl- we pray in your truth through Christ our Lord. Amen. So if you're new with us today, we're in the middle of a series on Jesus' life and ministry. And you might think, well, that's a good thing for church talking about Jesus. Uh, shouldn't you be doing that every Sunday? Uh, we're focusing on it right now because as is so often the case, not only the circumstances of our life, but even even those things which are important in our faith can sometimes eclipse the wonder and the beauty and the glory of who Jesus is. And one of the the things that is happening in the Bible, which is really not one book, the Bible is a library. It's a library of 66 books. It's written over a period of 1,500 years by over 40 different authors. And yet, over that vast span of time and wide diverse number of authors. There's one central message, this central message of of promise and hope that there is a Savior who's coming. And what happens in the Gospels is all of that, all of those years of promise, all of those years of hope reach their culmination in the person and in the work of Jesus. So that as we looked last week at his first sermon, he stood up in the synagogue and he read from the prophet Isaiah. And you remember he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord's anointed me to bring the good news to the poor and recovery of sight to the blind. 
And then he said the most radical thing anybody had ever heard. He sat, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant. He sat down, and uh, all the rabbis who had gone before him said, someday this scripture is going to be fulfilled. Someday. Jesus sat down and said what? Today. Today. I'm the one. I mean, it's an incredible statement. It's an incredible statement that a person would stand in the synagogue, the synagogue he grew up in, and say every single one of the promises and all the hopes of humanity, all of the things that God have been saying, has been saying over the centuries, they've, they've reached their, their climactic moment in me. Now, in fact, ever since that time, uh, not only have Christian theologians, but secular historians, numerous scholars, have said that Jesus stands at the forefront of what's going on in history. Uh, this, this quote's a little bit dusty and dated. It's from the 19th century. It's by a historian named Philip Schaff. And he wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander the Great or Caesar or Muhammad. And without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all the philosophers and scholars combined. And without the eloquence of school, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of the greats of ancient and modern times. And that's absolutely the case. It's impossible to conceive of world history without thinking of Jesus. And yet so often, at the forefront of our imagination and thought is something other than him. And so what God does is he wants to bring us up to this place. And it's what Jesus does with his apostles. He takes them to this place, alone with him. It says they went up on the mountain to pray. And then something happened. Something quite dramatic happened. They saw who he really was. Everything that they had wondered about previous to that moment was banished in this flash of revelation that the text says is transfiguration. He was transfigured before them. His face, in the other accounts of the Gospels, began to shine like the sun. His clothing was glowing with light. He was, in that moment, in a certain sense, transparent so that what was up to that moment unseen, the reality of who he is, became very, very clear in the eyes of the apostles. What were they doing while they were up on the mountain? Well, they were doing what many of you are doing right now. They were fast asleep. <laughs> Isn't that great to know that apostles went to church and fell asleep? Isn't that terrific? That is good news for the church today. And it is especially comforting for preachers. Because preachers for years have been doing important things that people sleep through. And we're just following the good shepherd. We're just following his lead. He did it too. And it says that when they were fully awake, then they saw his glory. What is it that's going on in this mountain? Well, let me suggest to you that there's three primary things that happen here. First of all, what happens is a revelation of Jesus' identity. Here's the second thing. There's a revelation that takes place of human destiny. And there's also a revelation about redemption certainty. Let's take up that issue of Jesus' identity first of all. Jesus' own identity. I don't know what John Stewart would say, but a few years ago, his predecessor really in so many ways, Larry King was asked, if he could choose one person in history, who would he want to interview? And he said, I would want to sit down and interview Jesus Christ. And then he was asked, well, what would you, what would you ask him? And he would say, I would ask Jesus if he was born of a virgin. Because that would define all of human history for me. It's very interesting. And King's got it exactly right. Because if Jesus is not born of a virgin, and furthermore, as Paul said, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then we are of all men most to be pitied. And this faith that we call the Christian faith should be shut down and locked away as the greatest lie in human history. It's a total delusion. It is an unnecessary expense. We should be playing golf or ha, shoveling snow, whatever. Something constructive. But here you are as a visible witness to a counterculture. 
Not everybody on a Sunday morning is doing what you're doing, but here you are. And you're here because many of you claim that Jesus has made himself real in your life. And the only way that could be true is actually if the virgin birth and the resurrection are a reality. That incarnation and resurrection are reality. But virgins don't have babies and dead men don't rise. That's not the normal course of human existence. And you mustn't think for a moment that the ancient world was kind of clueless about it. That as though they kind of thought, well, resurrection's normal. No, they didn't. Or that they didn't know where babies came from in the first century. No, they, they understood. But Jesus radically alters human history by coming to us through a door marked no entrance and coming back to us through a, marked, a door marked no exit. People don't show up by a virgin birth, and they don't come back from the dead, but he did. He did. That's what the gospel writers claim. And that means he's not simply man, though he is fully man. He's also, as the scriptures claim, fully God. And so in that moment, in that moment, defining all of history, there are the apostles asleep on the mountain, and suddenly they see Jesus glowing in the dark. The unseen reality of who he really is, the word become flesh, is now translucent before them, and they see, and he's not alone. Moses and Elijah are standing there with him. More about them in just a moment. And there's Jesus standing before them, and they get, they get awake, and then Peter Peter's wonderful at this. He, he, he says, I'm so glad we're here. Lord, it's good for us to be here. This is a great worship service. I was in a service once where some, you know, it was one of those services where you have a lot of impromptu prayers going on. Everybody's praying, oh, Lord, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you. And one lady said, Lord, I thank you that you're here today. But, oh, Lord, you should have been here last week. That service was really good. <laughs> well, he was there at both. And uh, the Lord, it's good for us to be here. It's good for us to be here. We'll build, we'll build three tabernacles. This, this feast is probably around the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what's going on. He said, we'll just stay here. We'll just stay here. And then a cloud rolls in. A cloud rolls in. What cloud is that? That's the glory cloud. It's the first time it showed up in Israel in over 600 years. The last time that cloud showed up in Israel was at Solomon's temple dedication. That cloud was the glory cloud of God. And when you read the Old Testament, that cloud only showed up at certain occasions and in certain places. It showed up, it showed up at the tabernacle of Moses. And it showed up at the temple of Solomon. And so here it is again, and what it's saying is, here's the new temple, here's the new tabernacle. You want to build three tabernacles? Forget about your tabernacles, you're looking at the tabernacle. You want to build a temple? You're looking at the temple. Uh, there's, here's, here's where my presence is in the world. The word has become flesh and is dwelling among you. And the voice then came out of a cloud. Just to make things worse for these sleepy apostles, they're not only surrounded now by a great thick glory fog, now a voice comes out of it. You talk, this, is, this is scary stuff. This is a, you know, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a kind English voice. I know most people think God has an English accent. But, but <laughs> you, know, you know, that's not the way. Oh, this is my son. Listen to him. You know, it wasn't, it, 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 it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. And we know it wasn't like that because in a couple of the other gospel accounts, what happens next? And this, this voice comes out of the cloud. Peter's talking. Peter's talking. And a voice comes out of the fog saying, saying basically, that's my son. Shut up. <laughs> listen to him. Shut your trap. That's the one you're supposed to listen to. The next words out of Jesus' mouth in Matthew's account and in Luke's account of this episode say that Jesus looked at the apostles and said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Those are the next words out of Jesus' mouth. Don't be afraid. Because this great fog had come in in this rather startling voice. This is my son. Listen to him. Who is Jesus? Who is he? Just a teacher? Just a prophet? No, no. Virgin birth, resurrection, glowing in the dark in the middle. This is God. This is God. This, this has been called by some scholars the Father's Sermon on the Mount. 
the Father's Sermon on the Mount. It's a short sermon. That's my son. Listen to him. What's the cloud? The Holy Spirit. What, what do we got here? We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who's on the mountain? The Holy Trinity. And the last time they all showed up together, you know what happened? The world started. That's what you find in the book of Genesis. All three moving together, fashioning the whole world. That's what happened. So what's going on here? Well, it's important to know the time frame. This point in Luke's gospel marks a pivot point in the story of Jesus. Up till now, there's been rising popularity. Up till now, crowds have followed him. They've seen his miracles. They've listened to his instruction. And there are vast multitudes of people who are going with him. But at this point in the gospel, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, he says these things. It happens right, right before this. He says, we're going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be put to death. And three days later, I'll rise, I'll rise again. Went right over their heads. But that's what he told them. And it's at this point that the whole gospel shifts. And Jesus begins a journey to Jerusalem which will lead ultimately to his death. We celebrate this event at this point in the year because we're about to make the turn ourselves. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. This coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And with Ash Wednesday we begin this 40 day journey to what? To Easter. To resurrection. But there's a stop along the way at crucifixion. Isn't there? It's more than a stop. It's a journey to crucifixion. It's a journey to the rest of Holy Saturday, to the Sabbath of that Saturday. It's a journey to the new first day of the new creation, of the resurrection day. That's what it's a journey to. And it's exactly at this point that Jesus takes three apostles. Who were they? Peter, James, and John. And he takes them up on the mountain to show them who he is. Because in only a few weeks' time, he's going to take the same three apostles, Peter, James, and John, and they're going to go back up on a mountain, and they're going to do the same thing they do on this mountain. They're going to fall asleep. But Jesus isn't going to be transfigured before them. He's not going to be glowing in front of them. He's going to be sweating drops of blood. He's going to be in agony because he knows the next day he's going to be betrayed. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. And those apostles would see that, and Jesus gave them a gracious moment right here on the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. He let them see who he really was, because they would also see what he was about to endure. Who is Jesus? He's the Lord of glory. He's God the Son. But he is, as Paul said, the Lord of glory who is crucified. But when, when Jesus stands here, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. He stands here in front of the apostles. He's not standing alone. It says here in the text, if you look at it in verse 30, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah were there with him. This is the second thing we need to know about what happens. It's human destiny. Moses and Elijah were long gone from the scene. Moses had died up on Mount Nebo. God buried him. Elijah, in the Old Testament scriptures, never dies. He's caught up into glory. You heard that beautiful song today during the offertory, Into the West, of understanding that what happens when we pass into death is sleep. And we're not simply sleeping in the arms of people who love us here. We are asleep, Paul wrote, in Jesus. And he says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, and I don't want you to grieve as those who have no hope. But those who've gone ahead of us, those who've gone ahead of us, will come again with Christ. We will enjoy that reunion with those who have gone ahead of us. We will rise. Those of us who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, we'll rise. We'll, we'll meet the Lord. And all those who've gone ahead of us, and even right now, today, as we gather here this morning, we are in communion and in fellowship with those who've gone ahead of us. Augustine and Athanasius, they're members of your church. Or it might be better to say you're members of theirs. 
But the church on high and the church on the earth are still one church. And this morning when we worship and we lift our hands and we lift our prayers, we're lifting them alongside the prayers of the saints who've gone before us. And some of you have those you love who've gone before us. And they're on high in glory. They're singing with you and you're singing with them and we're singing the song of the angels together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. There's Moses and Elijah. They're right there with Jesus. And they're right there with the apostles who are on the earth. Here is this fusion that happens in the beauty of the transfiguration. The church on the earth and the church in heaven is one and it's one in Jesus. Everybody is in this sweet fellowship. It shows up in the Apostles' Creed when it, we talk about the communion of the saints, that we're all together. But this reminds us of who we really are as human people. I don't know that we really see that. I don't know if we see the people sitting around us as immortals, as people who will transcend this existence Paul again writes in 2 Corinthians 4, though our outer man is decaying. How many of you are experiencing outer man decaying? Yeah, okay. Though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed every day. While we look not at the things that are seen, the places where we want our Botox and surgery, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. Oh, oh, that people would invest as much in their interior life as they do in their appearance in the appearance of their soul, as they did in the appearance of their body. Wouldn't that we trained our spirits the way we, we go to the gym. Beloved, beloved, do you recognize in your own neighbors this glory, this immortality of the soul? In his sermon, The Weight of Glory, and I've given this quote before, you're gonna hear it from me, oh, four to six times a year. C.S. Lewis, it was a sermon at St. Mary's. He wrote, It may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter. It is hardly possible for someone to think too often or too deeply about his neighbor. The load, the weight, the burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back, a load so heavy that only humility can carry it and the backs of the proud be broken. It is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or a horror, a corruption, such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. And all day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one of those two destinations. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, art, civilization, those are mortal. And their life is to ours like that of a gnat. They come and go. But it is immortals that we joke with and work with and marry and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. All around you are seated this morning and all around you at work tomorrow and in class tomorrow and all around you in your neighborhood are the future Moses and Elijahs, the future glories that stand in the holy mountain. How will you treat them? That's human destiny. Where are you going? Where are you going? There is more to you than meets the eye. You are an immortal. Have you embraced eternal life or eternal death? How do I know? And you know by how you respond to that revelation of who Jesus is. And that's why the third thing is redemption certainty. Because Jesus stands there on that cross 
stands on this, on this mountain, rather, and he talks to them about what's going to happen. And you see it in the talking point of Moses and Elijah. It says here in the text that Moses and Elijah were standing on the mountain talking with Jesus. In the text, here's what it says about Jesus approaching departure. But the word that Luke uses for departure is the word exodus. They were talking with Jesus about his upcoming departure from Jerusalem. From Jerusalem. Just a few weeks away, he's going to go to Jerusalem. And there, Jesus has already prophesied that the chief priests and the scribes are going to put him to death. How does Jesus, what's the word Luke uses to describe Jesus' death on the cross? They're talking about Jesus approaching Exodus. How many of you know that if Moses starts having a conversation with somebody about the Exodus, that's a conversation you want in on? Elijah made, Elijah made a departure. That was an exodus. When, when it says that what's about to take place for Jesus in Jerusalem is an exodus, that means that Jesus is the Lamb of God. What happened for Israel in Egypt? The Lamb was slain. They ate the Lamb at the Passover feast. And then when the angel of death passed over, they were liberated. And they went out of slavery into real life. And that's what's about to take place. That's what they're talking about. Jesus is saying to them, I'm going to die, but the reason I'm going to die is because I'm going to take you out of slavery, out of the slavery to the fear of death, out of the slavery to shame, out of the slavery of guilt, out of the slavery of chains to habits you can't break. I'm going to break those. I'm going to liberate you through my death and through my resurrection. I'm going to free you. No wonder Peter said, it's good for us to be here. And no wonder God said, that's my son. Listen to him. That was the conversation. This means that our exodus, our redemption is a certainty. And we can take that truth and we can either go to sleep with it, fall back asleep on the mountain, or we can take what happens on this mountain today and let it be for us a wake-up call. Years ago, years ago, a guy named uh, Johnny Nash wrote a song. He was down in Houston. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. All obstacles, I can see them now, all obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. The apostles' experience was the opposite. Not gone is the cloud that had me blind, but present is the cloud that opens my eyes. The cloud of the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And listen to this. Listen to this. How well can you see in a cloud? How well can you see in the fog? Listen to me. Listen carefully. The task of Christianity is not to give you easy answers to hard questions. The truth is that God in his mercy is not the subject of our study He's the cause of our wonder. And God places himself under no obligation to answer any of our questions. God, in the middle of our cloudiness, our fog, in the middle of our can't see it, I don't understand it, holds out Jesus to us and says, there's my son. Listen to him. And you may not have answers to every question about faith and science, about Christianity and morals. You may not have all the answers you want, and I make you no promises today that you'll get them. But I do make you this promise. God will give you his son. He will give you his son who gave his life in love for you. And if you have him, then no matter how many questions you have, your heart will be satisfied. And my prayer is that today, the Jesus the apostles saw is the Jesus your heart will see. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how desperately we need to be reminded of our great destiny. How desperately we need to be reminded that our redemptions Certainty. But in that place to see clearly Jesus' identity. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to the beauty, the wonder, the glory of who he is. Help now everyone here to put their trust in the sun who shines brighter than the sun we see. Help us in the midst of our cloud and fog to hear the voice of the Father saying, this is my son, listen to him. Jesus, thank you for giving us a glimpse of your glory. Prepare us for the wonder and the beauty of a vision that will never end. And we pray in your mighty name, amen. Let's stand together, stand with me please. And let's together with one heart and one voice today confess our, our faith together. Beloved of the Lord, those whose hearts have seen Jesus, in whom do you believe? I believe in one body, one spirit, and one hope. I believe in one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Great is the mystery of God. He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. I believe that Christ will come again and restore all that was broken by our fall. And until that day dawns, guide and keep me and his church by his grace and for his glory. Amen. Hey, let's sing and rejoice together today. Let me uh, give you the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord of glory lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>